Rashini Rajkumar, back with you. We have a topic to cover that's a troubling one for many people. It's definitely plagued the Catholic Church as well as other churches for what looks like decades. And the current Archbishop of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis is really trying to, from all accounts that I can see, trying to be a source of healing, and he's made some moves in the last couple days toward that. He's also speaking with young people, pulling together a listening session Wednesday night at the Basilica of St. Mary to talk with young adults ages 18 to 39. He is Archbishop Bernard Hebda. Thank you, Archbishop, for joining us today. Oh, you're most welcome, Rashini. Nice to have this chance to talk. Yeah, so you've, it's been an active few days. Uh, on Friday, we understand we found out for the first time that you have been looking into uh, some information about the investigation into your predecessor, John Dinestead, with the Vatican. What can you tell us about that? Why do you want that information? Well, I, I just think um, as we try to place uh, victim survivors first, in, in our deliberations and as we strive to move forward for, for some healing, it's, it seems that we really need to take seriously any information that we have. And on the one hand, to make sure that we continue to have safe environments, um, but also really to be respectful of, of those who have come forward and shared stories with us. And as uh, we've been looking at, at uh, some of the information that we've had for quite a while. I, I guess we were in the middle of bankruptcy. We were very focused on that. But as we, we've taken a, a fresh look at uh, some of the information that we had before that, uh, things that happened um, early, early on in my time here or before that I arrived, uh, we saw that this was one area that really needed to be addressed. And it seemed like we, we couldn't wait any longer for that. So I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, we have a really fine uh, review board, a primarily lay group that uh, serves to ad- advise me in these matters, especially uh, considering questions of fitness for ministry. And um, I, as I asked them and consulted with them about a proper uh, way of, of moving forward with this, uh, they strongly suggested that we, we, we encourage there to be some resolution of this matter and that in the meantime that we would um, publicly take this action uh, that involves my predecessor, Archbishop Neinstead. So I'm really grateful to them, also really grateful to uh, uh, Tom Johnson, who serves as our uh, ombudsperson, ombudsman, uh, really uh, has such great uh, passion for helping uh, victim survivors. He was very instrumental in in, uh, really encouraging us to take this move as well. I also understand, Archbishop, that you have created a new position to help survivors. Tell us about that. Yes. So it's it's really uh, just evolved, and we've put together a job description. We're going to be looking for that person uh, after the first of the year. The hope is that um, uh, we're able to bring somebody into our central administration, and we think we have a few good options, who would be able to always remind us of the survivor's point of view. And, you know, from uh, even before I got here, the, the diocese was really striving to put the needs of victim survivors first. and But to, to do that in an institutional way, it seems like we need to have a stronger voice, uh, not just in, in matters involving, uh, directly involving um, abuse or safe environments, but in the other things that we're doing in the archdiocese as well. And so the thought would be that if we have someone who's able to speak out of his own experience or her own experience, uh, who's able, who, who is familiar with the survivor community and and some of the needs that are there that maybe we would be more sensitive in moving forward certainly to um, you know continue with our our efforts in safe environment uh, but also in in terms of um, some actions that would like to take for healing I'm talking with Archbishop Bernard uh, Bernard Hebda and he is sharing why he wants to make sure His leadership stays open to victims of sexual abuse and also bring in new people, key people in the church. 
Archbishop, as I was getting ready to chat with you last night, reading some materials last night, I got a troubling email from the provincial of the Midwest province of the Society of Jesus. You know them as the Jesuits. I went to a Jesuit university undergrad, Boston College, and he tells us that they just released a list of names of Jesuits with an established allegation of sexual abuse of a minor in the region of the Midwest province since 1955. So it was really on point about our conversation today. I wanted to share that with you. I was saddened by it. What do you think each one of us can do, whether people are Catholic or not, to take in these kinds of headlines that are coming in all the time? Yes. So I I think on the the one hand, it's I think we we can welcome the fact that groups like the Jesuits or different dioceses that have made this information public that they're committed to um, to coming clean and to help as, as part of the the healing process, and also to make sure that environments are safe. So that we put out there all of those names of people who have been uh, found found to have abused, and as, as we speak with uh, victim survivors. That's often such an, so important for them that there being an acknowledgement of what had happened, and also um, for those victim survivors who were reluctant to come forward, uh, once they see the, the name of of an, uh, of an abuser uh, on those lists, they feel empowered to speak about what happened to them as well, and so that's that's an important way of moving forward. I think that I was happy to hear you speak about non-Catholics as well, though, Rashini, because. I think we, we have to recognize that uh, the problem of abuse of minors is something that's in in every every sector of society these days. It's really troubling statistics. And so just for, for us in general in, in the community to, you know, have a sense for how prevalent this is in, in, in society and how important it is that not just in, in our churches or schools, but that we, we really are taking this seriously as a community. And uh, looking for those opportunities to uh, to strengthen our safe environment programs and to empower our young people and to give them and and uh, the education that they need and also really to educate all of those who are working with uh, youth and young uh, youth and young people uh, as as we provide uh, safe environment training so that they're able to recognize the signs of of possible abuse. We have a lot of texts coming in for for you. One person saying. So appreciate my priest who talks openly during the homily when relevant about the sins of the church. At our last mass, he talked about joy. No one can take that away from you. Keep the faith. And I will say that about the priest at my church, Our Lady of Grace in Edina. Uh, Our priest there is very open. Uh, you You can tell when he is preaching that he is pained by some of these things, Archbishop. Yes. No, there, you know, it's been a very difficult time for our our priests. I think they they very much want to um, walk with people in the in their parishes who are really having a difficult time with the the things that they've they've learned in whether it be this year or in, in the past. And I, I think that our, our priests do a, a really fine job with that. And at the listening session that we had for young adults last week, I. I kind of looked for a a show of hands as to how many are in communities where their priests have spoken about these issues openly or where they feel that they're able to talk about it. It was a majority, but barely a majority. So I know there are a lot of of parishes, a lot of communities where it's still very difficult to enter into that discussion. Obviously, we want our priests always to respect the the tone of the liturgy and as, you know, as uh, the, the person who sent the text spoke about joy that was certainly you know very uh, was an appropriate theme for this Sunday's um, uh, homily uh, since we, we as Catholics were celebrating Gaudete Sunday the joyful Sunday in Advent and but to look for those opportunities of, of uh, being able to discuss these things that are in people's minds and hearts in a way that uh, really re- uh, touches on what was in the, the, the scripture readings. I am talking with Archbishop Bernard Hebda. You can talk with him, too. Send me a text, 81807. Let's talk about your listening sessions. You had one last week in St. Paul. You're inviting young adults tomorrow, ages 18 to 39, of the Archdiocese, and I'm hoping that even anyone listening today who might not be a member, you'd welcome attending, to come to the Basilica of St. Mary's Wednesday night from 7 to 9. What do you hope to accomplish with that? 
Yes. So on the, on the one hand, it gives me an opportunity to hear what's in their hearts. You know, there was a, an open letter that was written to me and signed by many uh, young adults in our community asking for that kind of dialogue and really offering also as assistance. You know, our, our, our young Catholics and young people in general bring so many gifts, especially in the area of communications or analysis of data. They want to be part of the solution here. They have a, a real sense of uh, justice where they, they want the church to really be reaching out to victim survivors and to be, to be treating them with, with great respect. Uh, they want us to make sure that we're creating uh, an environment that's going to be safe for their kids. If they, they, a lot of them don't have children yet, but they're planning on that, and uh, they want to make sure that they're going to be able to uh, uh, really trust their 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 priests and their their churches and our Catholic schools as places where their kids will have authentic encounters with uh, with with the Lord and uh, with their faith and w without any difficulties of abuse. So I think I think that's really significant for them, and uh, and just really a, a, a desire to understand more deeply what it is that has prompted this difficulty in society, and how, especially as it's reflected in the church. And you are also making yourself available Friday afternoons, is that correct, uh, for part of next year to talk yes. with people? But but most especially on those Friday afternoons uh, for uh, uh, survivors of abuse. You know, we've, um, we're just finishing up this week um, with, the, the, with bankruptcy, with the bankruptcy proceedings. And so in, for the last uh, four years, we've been in a somewhat stressful relationship in the minds of some uh, with those who have um, been victims and, or survivors of abuse. And uh, now that that's going to be um, behind us in terms of the legal process, we want to look for those ways of uh, really being able to, to learn from the experience of our survivors, uh, but also to give them the chance to, to speak to me about the things that are in their heart to the extent that they, they would like that. So there's no pressure on anybody to come. But uh, really, if, if that's something that, that people would ap appreciate, we're hoping that they'll do that. We've, we, we've tried to extend that offer before. This makes it a little bit more uh, maybe user friendly that you know that we would offer Friday afternoons in that way in February, March, and April. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that I, I'll have the chance to uh, meet some of those people who had been involved in in our lawsuit, whom I've never met before. I've I've met with a, a good number of survivors, and I've I found it helpful for me in terms of um, shaping the direction in which our, our church needs to move. And I, I think that a number of the survivors have said it's been helpful for them to be able to uh, get some matters off of their chest as well and, and to hear the, the, the church apologize to them. We have many texts coming in for you. One person saying, breathtakingly beautiful to hear. Another, I appreciate openness at the pulpit. It includes domestic violence and addiction, too. And, you know... Archbishop uh, Hebda, it seems that some priests are more comfortable than others with that openness, but it's so great to hear that you at the top are really being open because hopefully you can set that example. We have questions, and I'll lump about four of them together, wondering why can't the church ever consider priests to marry? Yes. Well, um, can I step back just, just for sure, one second? absolutely. I'll, I'll get to that. When you were talking about uh, priests being able to address these things, that was one of the things that really came out of our young adult listening session was they have great love for their priests. And what they were asking me is how do we provide priests with the training that they need, whether it be while they're in seminary or after ordination, that, that helps them to deal with uh, an uncomfortable situation. So that was one of the things that, that our young adults were asking for, huh? Um, on the second question that you asked, or the question that you asked about uh, married priests, you know, there, there, there are in, in parts of the world priests who were married. And so it, that's not beyond the, mm, the pale of possibilities by any, any means. So in, in the Eastern churches, Eastern Catholic churches, that's been part of their tradition. So it's a, for us in the, in the Latin church, in the Western church, it's certainly a, a, a wonderful spiritual tradition, and, and many priests. Um, uh, certainly have, have experienced their celibacy as a gift, but we also know that it's a, it's a challenge for others. And uh, it's, it's, it's always difficult, but and for some it's a, it's a, a real real challenge. 
And so I, I certainly think that there's um, the possibility of greater debate of, of how it, a married clergy could have some role in our church and how that might have an impact. You know, we uh, Pope Francis has indicated a willingness to to speak about that, and he's, he's authorized some Episcopal conferences to in those areas where uh, there are many, many Catholics and very few priests, especially to see if there might be some way in which uh, men of proven virtue, so uh, th- those who are maybe a little bit older who already have uh, a lifetime of experience under their belt uh, of assisting the church, how they might be able to uh, step in to celebrate the Eucharist, which is really at the heart of what our priests do, even though that they're, they're even though they would be married, that we would be calling forth those men. So I, I think it's a discussion that we will be hearing more about in the in the in the months and years to come, uh, for sure. Here in the archdiocese, we have a number of um, priests who are married who have um, s- served as ministers in other traditions, and um, who have become Catholic and with permission of the Vatican they've been able to uh, continue their ministry as, as married priests. They certainly bring a, a great expertise in terms of family life uh, to the ministry of the priests. I, I, I think that our, our priests who aren't married certainly have great insights in that area, but um, there certainly is something that, that comes from being a husband and a father, or now a grandfather, uh, that brings something to the ministry as well. So we're, we're grateful for their gifts. He is Archbishop Bernard Hebda. He, besides English, speaks Italian. He knows Latin, French, and Spanish. And Archbishop, you've been so terrific today. I want to wind down with kind of a lighter question. What do you do for fun? (laughs) I love living in the Twin Cities. It's been really a great uh, experience for me. Unfortunately, I I like to eat way too much. I know what you mean. I I get that. We haven't got a lot of good restaurants. There are so many great places, so many... uh, uh, different cultures that are represented in the cuisine here in the Twin Cities. But I, I love spending time talking to people. I like movies. I like watching sports. Um, I, I, I like going out for walks. Um, those kinds of things. And, and here in, in nature is, is everywhere. <laughs> so it's, it's been a really good fit for me that uh, gives me lots of opportunities to relax and also to appreciate uh, God's goodness. Well, as you go on three years of being the Archbishop of the Diocese of Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, we thank you for chatting with us today. And young adults can talk with you tonight from or Wednesday night from seven to nine p.m. December nineteenth at the Basilica of St. Mary in downtown Minneapolis. Thank you so much for.